<laughs> Buenas noches. <laughs> so lovely to be with you all. Thank you so much. And yeah, really nice to have our first well of being sit of the new year. And as ever, just a delight to be together in community. And I just want to highlight what was already said, especially if there are some new folks that we really have this incredible, unique opportunity to sit together as community at the Dharma Collective, where the volunteers support and run the space. Everyone and anyone can support and run the space. It's just a pretty awesome experience and, and relates directly to the work we're doing here. So we've been making our way through. We're now actually all the way at chapter six of this lovely book. So again, if anyone is here for the first time, no problem. Each chapter is a new theme. Each chapter relates to a theme that's essential for waking up on the path. And this week, the theme that we will delve into, really, it's such a lovely couple of things. Some of you may remember um, in, in early pandemic, when we we're some of us getting used to Zoom, I actually mentioned the disciplines that were so helpful and important for us to keep in mind, the spiritual disciplines to keep in mind as actually how we show up on Zoom. So these six quintessential qualities that we're always thinking about and keeping in mind, I'll mention them briefly. We'll do our sit and then we will walk through the text together, but just to kind of season our mind with these, even as we begin our sit, that these six perfections or these qualities that are essential for waking up on the path. Generosity, which was just spoken of and Again, it's amazing. This Sangha especially is one of generosity. Everyone comes here um, supporting one another to show up. Discipline, which sounds a little more harsh than it may actually be for many of you who know discipline. The discipline is truly the most amount of unharm that we can do to ourselves and to others. How disciplined can we be? Like even here I am in Costa Rica, there's a lot of mosquitoes. So how gently can I scratch my itches, right? How much, how much softness of harm can I do to myself and to others? We also have patience, uh, which we will hopefully cover tonight. My hope is tonight we'll get into generosity, discipline, and patience. Patience, again, not a huge hot selling topic, not in your top 10 list of retreat topics you see people that wouldn't sell out on any retreat calendar but patience is in my opinion of the six the most important it's the one that if we really develop that patience it's actually a lot like our meta awareness our ability to see our thoughts and our feelings without getting just so fused with them immediately and some really lovely selections tonight on patience this book we've been going through as many of you know who've been coming week to week it takes just these kind of quintessential teachings from great masters spanning thousands of years. So to read, especially tonight on patience, one of my favorite teachings of all time. So that will be quite a treat, but the six perfections uh, I haven't mentioned so far is we had generosity, discipline, patience, joyous effort. So sometimes the practice can just feel like something we have to do. And maybe some of us have New Year's Eve resolutions we're trying to fulfill right now, like showing up, and meditating, and can get a little stale. So this idea of just kind of this joyous effort, how lucky are we we get to practice together? How wonderful. What a treat to get to be connected even in this somewhat uncertain, ongoing, difficult time for many of us. And then we have concentration which we'll dive into deeply. In the context of especially being online together, concentration is a really nice one to keep in mind. It can be really challenging for us to use our screen for one thing at a time. Like here we are in our meditation practice, but maybe we should check our email or our text or right do something we forgot about. And this idea of how can we bring these, um, these perfections even into our practice this evening of, giving ourselves the concentration of holding up, showing up here fully. And wisdom, and wisdom as almost always is a quality that it's like the very ground of which the other aspects rise up from. Without the wisdom, your generosity might just become something 
kind of transactional. Oh, I should give something to the Dharma Collective because they said I should, and that feels like the right thing to do. But with wisdom, we know that in a blunt way, everything is changing and impermanent. Why hold on? Why not just give? So when we have that glimpse of wisdom, it actually infuses all these other paramitas, all these other spiritual qualities. Those are going to be our theme for this evening, probably next week as well. So I'm here with you tonight, and next week Chandra will be back, and then I think we'll probably do a combination again. And we'll start off with a sit tonight of really getting ourselves settled, getting our minds settled, feeling present, and then maybe transitioning into just a bit of loving presence for ourselves. Um, I know for some of you who work in public education, healthcare, it's a really, really, really hard time on top of a really, really, really hard time. So I just really appreciate um, all of you showing up and taking care of yourself by being here. And yeah, let's, let's give ourselves this wonderful gift of dropping in together. So take a moment to find a posture that will really support you tonight. That could be taking a posture that's actually looking away from the screen or dimming your screen. For some of us, that's gonna be the regal dignified posture of laying down. Shavasana is a wonderful posture for meditation. Otherwise, if you decide to have an upright position, really find this tall spine, often said like a stack of gold coins. We don't want that tall to feel rigid. We don't want it to feel too tight. So making sure that there's that nice natural curve in our spine. It can be comfortable for us to have a slight lift under our sit bones. Maybe putting a cushion there. And having a lot of freedom around our waistline. So if you have any constricting clothing, just giving yourself a moment to give yourself some space there so that your breath can be full through the belly. Finding a nice position for your head resting on top of your neck. Then you can do so maybe by checking it out what it's like when your head is just tilting too far back. Sometimes can happen when we are thinking too much or if the head starts to slope forward like when we get tired, maybe finding it just evenly on top of the neck, just the slightest downward pointing of the chin. Finding a position for your hands either on top of your thighs or folded in your lap. It allows your shoulders to feel comfortable and not strained. And then softening, 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 softening through the face. You choose to have your eyes fully closed, partially open, just gazing in front of you. Taking a couple moments here to just feel the support of the ground beneath you.
so easy to take for granted the support. Maybe for a moment, just bring this lens of gratitude and appreciation for the support. In this world where there is gravity, how fortunate that there is ground. begin to settle into the body. Feeling the body from within the body. Inviting your attention and awareness is then Fill the entire space of the body. Feel the qualities of the body stable and present. And though, of course, many sensations are moving. Overall, the body is a body of stillness. And of course, we notice thoughts, memories, and images, planning, and to-dos. So we invite ourselves to start settling your speech by connecting to the rhythm of the breath. It can be easy to notice the natural rhythm of the breath at the belly. Inviting our attention to follow the breath as the belly rises and continue to follow the breath with our full attention as the belly gently deflates and beginning again. Inhale, noticing the belly. Exhale, noticing the belly. And releasing to the background as much as possible. The other chatter, inner communication and dialogue.
although it may not feel this way, if you could imagine the quality of silence to our inner speech, or at least gently turning the volume down. And gently shifting to settle the mind in its natural state. A state of spaciousness, vividness, clarity. This might feel as though we were leaning back in our mind. In order for us to feel this quality of spaciousness of our own awareness, we can invite a sense of deep relaxation, pliancy through the mind and the body. can be helpful here. Continue settling the mind by just counting 21 breaths. Making a single simple count at the very top of the inhale before the exhale. become distracted and you're counting no problem. Just relax and release and start again. Doesn't matter how far you get. Just this practice of coming back over and over. Just a little while longer counting the breath. Wherever you are in counting, let me finish through the last exhale. And now that we've spent a little bit of time here, settling our body, 
our speech and our mind in their natural states, stillness, silence, vividness and clarity. We take a moment and connect to our intention. Our intention, of course, on this path and in this practice is always reminding us to wake in the heart. To cultivate our own mind and heart in order to be of service for all beings. And with that, as our greater intention and aspiration, maybe there's an intention and aspiration today which feels poignant or relevant. Could be feeling connected or wanting to feel grounded. Consider an intention that feels meaningful today, supporting that greater overarching aspiration of bodhicitta. Now we shift our attention and awareness, noticing the body. Maybe we notice areas of the body that feel unpleasant, achy, difficult in some way. Maybe we notice there's other areas of the body that feel quite pleasant. Maybe warmth or light, tingling. In some areas, which are just neutral, maybe the tip of our thumb, the bottom of our earlobe. And for a couple moments here, we'll just allow ourselves to notice different areas of the body. Notice the quality of sensations, heavy or light or aching, tingling or warm. And consider, are these sensations pleasant, unpleasant, or simply neutral? as we are watching and observing the sensations in the body. 
new sensations may occur. And what's key for observing, noting sensation is pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Is again, having that fundamental sense of ease and relaxation in the mind and in the body. Allowing ourselves to be curious about sensations. And that curiosity even feels a bit kind. So we're not searching out, trying to find our sensations, exerting pressure. The openness, curiosity, noticing sensation. And as much as possible, without judgment, labeling them as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. may seem like such a simple task, noting the sensations in the body. But so much of our suffering comes from not wanting to feel our experiences. To be able to just simply note and identify, just training for freedom. while still maintaining an awareness of being in our body. We shift our attention and awareness now to the domain of mind and thoughts. Instead of trying to hold our thoughts at bay, we simply open up and let the true stream of thoughts come through. And notice if our thoughts are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, without engaging, without judging, just noting our thoughts.
be made, even notice when a thought comes. We identify it as pleasant or unpleasant. It brings with it possibly sensations in the body as well. Again, as much as possible with that gentle curiosity. Simply note, notice the thoughts as they come. And whether the experience of them is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And then as though just gently turning up the heat. Turning up that experience of gentleness and curiosity. A bit more to feel like warmth and presence. Like a kind accompaniment to our experience. And then turn down or soften the focus on noticing explicitly each thought. So feel this warm, loving presence. Be with whatever is happening in the body and the mind. Thank you for your practice. Any thoughts, questions, or reflections on that practice? We haven't done a Vedana practice in a while. 
that was a fun one to do together, beginning of the new year here. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand, write it in the chat, whatever works. Anyone want to share something that happened in their practice? It's always interesting, practice reports. Some of you who've done Mahasti Sayadaw retreats know that you're expected to report on the quality of your practice. It's really helpful when we kind of try to explain what happened. Um, it can, not only is it useful for us, it's generally useful for others too. So if that's any encouragement, it doesn't have to be profound touching into enlightenment. Just anything you noticed, anything you want to share? I'll share. Great, Sally then, yes. Um, then Karen. Yes. <laughs> when you mentioned the tip of the um, earlobe, <laughs> I was like feeling that. And then I was kind of like, I was like, oh, wow, that's so interesting to like try to feel there. And then I was imagining everybody else trying to feel there. And then I felt this like sense of community over Zoom of like, oh, maybe like we're all kind of trying to feel that strange <laughs> spot in our earlobe right now. Um, and then I also, yeah, I guess I just like felt like really deeply the, the need for this. I'm like, mm. I'm working in a hospital right now and it's mm. so intense and um I was like, wow. Yeah, I just like I'm a I'm a chaplain there and um, mm -hmm. I give a lot of this to others. And I was like, wow, you know, just a classic of like, oh, I really need to be cultivating my own peacefulness right now. So thank you. Thank you, Sally. Yeah. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you for being with us. Nick, I saw your hand. You're somewhere really beautiful. I have, a, I have a beautiful picture. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, I, I don't recall ever having the um, instruction to, uh, to um, you know, applying Vedana to thoughts. So that kind of, oh, oh, really? I, I kind of was taken aback a little. Bit. That's cool. Let's investigate that. You know, usually like uh, for body sensations, neutral or uh, neither neutral or, uh, you know, uh, pleasant. But I don't recall applying it to thoughts, but that's kind of interesting. It's a, a something that I can investigate. So just thanks for yeah. that. I'm just lovely. Yeah. I felt very settled. Wonderful. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's funny because we do labeling of our thoughts, right? So like planning, thinking, you know, the whole kind of granularity spectrum that people apply, but they don't usually do beta enough. I've only heard it instructed by one other teacher before. Um, and I think it's interesting. Um, I think it is because there's a lot of content of our thoughts and, and labeling is extremely useful, but to also just kind of recognize, honestly, the toll a lot of our thoughts have. It's like, oh, a lot of like neutral and pleasant stuff going on. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for your willingness to try it out. Karen. Hi, Eve. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, thank you for that. I hadn't done anything like that for a while now, and it was um, really fun to sort of get back in the body. And I have been, I was out walking recently and doing some exercise so I was a little sore so I kept feeling all these like little pinches everywhere and that I hadn't really noticed like even in my face um and I too really liked the earlobes uh, that was a really fun place to land um yeah and the thoughts was really fun too I um you know it was really nice to try to link them to a body sensation and to figure out if it was like pleasant or 
unpleasant and neutral and to see how many were which. Um, and then, yeah, like towards the end, trying to make the connection between thoughts and the body was, was interesting and something that I kind of wanted to do more of. So, yeah, thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I do think, um, you know, I, I was really lucky just before I came down here, um, I got five days of personal retreat and was doing um, more sustained practice. And you can really, it's almost like, it's almost like you can see a thought coming from down the block and it's like coming and then your whole body's like, oh my God, there's a thought. And you can like feel it as an experience, it's wild. Um, and so I, I, I too have been really interested in getting curious and yeah, a lot of, it's funny, a lot of the thoughts that I think are actually pretty neutral actually feel kind of good in my body. Like this, like for me, especially like getting stuff done and planning thoughts, there's like a little zing, like, Ooh, that's nice. <laughs> and it's like, Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah not really right or wrong but just interesting to see that reward system at play possibly um i see a couple questions here in the chat um to me i have a lot of pain in my body so i often don't listen to my body tonight's meditation was great to hear my body differently so glad to hear that and yeah you, you know it's, it's interesting this practice we can almost thank this practice in some ways for um or, or not thank it if, if you want to for a lot of the commercial success of meditation and mindfulness. This practice, you know, is one that is really helpful in working with pain and not the whole series of what we did, but really staying with the body and focusing in on this interesting subtlety of there's sensation, there's our label on sensation, and then there's like a fighting of that experience generally or a not wanting of it. So, you know, when we have physical pain because we've gone on a walk or we have a chronic pain issue, it's not just the sensations. It's not just our naming of that's, that's lower back pain or that's right shoulder pain. It's the, oh, it's bad, it's wrong. And I wish it were gone. Why is it happening to me? And so to just kind of zip in to just being with the experience. It is tricky though. I, um, some of you know, I have pretty significant lower back issues and, and sitting on retreat. I don't recommend sitting through the pain. I have done that and it works, but I, I can't imagine it always does. So I think it's a really delicate thing. And what we might do, especially if we have acute pain is, is it kind of vacillate or oscillate between being with the pain in your low back or your shoulder, and then going to the earlobe, going somewhere neutral then maybe you're kind of like settled and it feels okay to go back and be with the sensations of pain and then find somewhere neutral. So thank you for that, Geneva. Um, and then, and so no, you don't ignore your pain. Um, I, I like this word, I, you know, it came up in um, a teaching I was recently looking at this accompaniment, like being with, being with our pain. Um, um, I also see, I think, Lisa, did you raise your hand too? I'd be happy to hear more about that question. Yes, Lisa Bratz, there's two Lisas, sorry about that. Can you unmute for us, Lisa, on that question about pain? Sorry, yeah, yeah, hi, hi, oh, yeah. hi everyone. Yeah, hi. very, very nice session. And it's funny, I started off I cried in the beginning and then I don't even, I, I don't remember what triggered me hmm. in what thought, but um, what I want to bring up is lately I I'm really having issues with the ruminating thought. And so like a, uh, I had a phone call with a friend and it got very heated about the vaccines and I'm, she knows I'm not feeling well and she was laying a big trip and I, I didn't react and you know we the, my phone ended up running out but um, 
And then another friend who was like supporting me with the health, the way I'm feeling, completely goes to me. And I keep thinking of these two friends, like they both, and it's like, you know, I'm really holding anger and resentment yeah. towards them. And so when we were doing the practice, and I'm, I'm, you know, practicing trying to release it and not go there. And then doing this practice, um, I totally time traveled and was back clear as day, maybe 20 years ago with an incident of, of a, um, you know, another social, uh, I don't know what to call it, dis, I don't know. It was like a maltreatment in a social situation by someone and I was just like wow you know that's where I'm going yeah and they're they're yeah. like thorns yes they're that's a that's a great word to describe it and you know I do think it, it can be tough with acute rumination and especially Lisa I'm sorry you're not feeling well and when we feel vulnerable right when we feel kind of um undefended in a way um it's it's tough like that experience of pain and and ache and then you know not being protected and you know one thing i always return to in the practice is it's actually really difficult to practice if we don't feel safe period and sometimes we need a level of psychological and physical safety um, in order to practice and and that's that's tough right because Psychological safety, especially, is at a premium these days. It's hard for us to feel um, that level of ease. And, you know, fortunately, sometimes just being together, it helps. We are, when we are with other human beings um, who there's a level of trust for, we, we regulate each other and, and that can support it. And, you know, I think sometimes, especially in like the acute pain phase where we're feeling hurt and betrayed, it can be really nice to do more heart practices just for ourselves. Um, and if that's too upsetting, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm so down for alternative approaches, including journaling, um, including doing something that's healthy distraction. Because um, it sounds like Lisa, you know, that just that pain is, you know, when we have that feeling betrayal and then we feel angry. And of course, I don't know the details, but it creates well, it, I mean, close. It's, yeah, they're they're being kind of cruel, you know, thinking. Yeah. 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 And I and I I I I think that um and I know that's a know, label and a judgment and yeah. Well, it could be true. And then there's no problem with label and judgment. All I'm saying is in 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 relating it to our practice, um sometimes we don't necessarily want to go like focus because I think what you're describing really well and happens to all of us is sometimes when we're focusing in practice, it actually can agitate us, right? And so how do we, how do we make that space and that loving space? And it might be more like compassion practices. Um, so there's, you know, quite a lot of Tonglen practices we have recorded from, from the sessions Chandra and I both need. And that's a really nice practice to work with when we're feeling, um, especially relational and emotional pain. So yeah. we can happily drop that to you in the chat if you'd like. And yeah, thanks for being with us tonight. Yeah, it was very nice. Very, very nice. Thank you. Just to interject on that, if you look in the, the practices are online and we usually write a little description and in the description, in the first couple of lines, we always try to put what kind of meditation um, Eve or Chandra led for that class. So you can just kind of scroll through and see right away if it was a Tonglen uh lead session on youtube on youtube wonderful thanks everyone uh it's great to hear from folks it's really nice to hear um what's happening here and um thanks walt <laughs> for that uh illustrative update about um your grandson it's really it it is funny you know we have these words and labels to identify our experience. Of course, eventually we want to not need the words and labels and just be in our experience. And it's nice to remember that these words and labels are constructs, we created them. They aren't what we feel. They're just applying to what we feel. 
So I'm gonna go ahead here and just start. Um, for those of you who have the book, I'm just starting on the chapter eight. I said six. I guess I got a little confused there. And this is the six perfections. And I actually wanna start on, on page 108, very auspicious, but it's really, there's such a beautiful and pith teaching here. So I mentioned that there are these six perfections these six perfections, I'm gonna call them paramitas because that's the that's how I learn them and, and perfections just keep getting me caught up. But these perfections are paramitas of generosity, discipline, joyous effort, concentration, and wisdom. And you know, that's quite a mouthful. And there's a single verse here and it has all of them together. So I'm gonna read it twice because it's just so lovely. Of like, how do these weave together? Virtue that is filled with loving kindness and compassion is generosity when practiced for the sake of all beings. It is discipline when free from self-concern and patience when untiring for the sake of others. It is diligence when done with vibrant joy and concentration when enacted with one-pointed mindfulness. It is wisdom when there's no clinging to the reality of things from virtues such as these six perfections never separate. So again, just so beautifully weaving in that each of these qualities, its root is loving kindness and compassion. That it's from loving kindness and compassion, our last chapter, which you know, is so beautiful, this idea of you know, our natural humanistic capacity of altruism to be of service. It's, it's not an overstatement to say it's what we're designed for and to really cultivate that quality of loving kindness it feeds it's like it's like the big tributary river maybe you can hear the river in the background here i'm right next to a huge river and there's all this like main river and then all the little streams that come from it so you think of loving kindness as just that kind of headwaters and it gives forth it gives rise to all these beautiful tributaries so just once again, virtue that is filled with loving kindness and compassion is generosity when practiced for the sake of all beings. It is discipline when it is free from self-concern and patience when untiring for the sake of others. So our compassion is patience when it's untiring. Our compassion is discipline when it isn't about self-concern and it's generosity when it's practiced for all beings. And the loving kindness and compassion is diligence when done with vibrant joy and concentration when enacted with one point of mindfulness. It is wisdom when there's no clinging to the reality of things. From virtues such as this, never separate. I just, yeah. I'm going to have to sit with that verse. I, I've read this book already, I think twice, and that didn't, didn't stick with me until I got to think about sharing it with you all. I just really, just such a beautiful weaving together. The next uh, little verse here I want to share and then and chat about is by Atisha. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite an intense list. I am gonna read the list. Uh, there's three parts of the list I want us to focus on, but essentially Atisha, who's this great master as all of them are, is asked, what are the best elements of the path? And I think this is confusing. This is also on page 108. When we say best, it doesn't mean like, I don't know, best just feels like a, a really judgmental word, actually. So when we're thinking of the best elements of the path, we're actually thinking of most appropriate, most wholesome, most helpful. So what are the most helpful elements of the path? The, you know, he says, the best scholar is one who has realized the absence of true existence. The best monk is one who has subdued his mind. The best quality is great altruism. The best instruction is to always watch your mind. The best medicine is to know that nothing has independent existence. The best conduct is one that is not in accord with those of the world. The best achievement is the progressive reduction of negative emotions. 
The best sign of accomplishment is the steady decline of desires. The best generosity is non-attachment. The best discipline is pacifying the mind. The best patience is humility. The best effort is abandoning ordinary activities. The best concentration is the unaltered state of mind. The best wisdom is not to believe in the real existence of anything. The best teacher is the one who attacks your hidden faults. The best instruction is one that hits your secret faults. The best friends are mindfulness and vigilance. The best incentives for practices are enemies, obstacles, illnesses, and suffering. The best method is to not alter the mind. The best, men the best benefit is to have set someone on the path of Dharma. The best way to help others is to turn their mind to the path of liberation quite a list. The ones I wanted to highlight are the best teacher is one who attacks your hidden faults. And the best instruction is one that hits your secret hidden faults. And I bring that up not because I'm going to make fun of you or poke fun at you. <clears throat> but I do think of, you know, when we think of the teachings um, and teachers, and he actually says, like, the best incentives for practice are our enemies, our obstacles, illness, our challenges. And, you know, many of us don't have a relationship with a teacher where they can point out our faults. They don't, they don't know us well enough. We don't see them all the time. That, that's not the rules of engagement that we have set up. But through these texts, I do think it's not that we're attacking hidden faults, but we are revealing over and over the delusion, over and over the ways we get stuck. And that that's part of it. You know, I think there's a way sometimes we hear these teaching, it's like, oh, what am I not doing wrong, right? <laughs> like all these things are, they're, they're a lot. It can feel like taking on a lot. Like how do we subdue the mind? How do we reduce desires? How do we over and over put others before us? It's a long list, but that's the point. It's actually important for us to really continue looking and digging and scraping at that which is keeping us from our own happiness. This is not a test for the sake of test. These kind of looking at our faults and examining ourselves, it's for us. Because when, you know, it's, it's just really, um, it's humbling to think of the beauty of this simple idea that the Buddha, whether or not you believe in him as a true historical figure had, which is, I need to give people the one thing it will actually make them happy. Nothing else. No amount of asceticism, like giving up everything in the world. No amount of indulgence. None of that can make people happy. I am committed to the one thing that will make people happy. And unfortunately, it requires self-excavation. Kind of like looking at stuff over and over to help us get free. And this idea that the instruction, the best instruction is the one that hits our faults. I hope that's encouraging. I hope that that's a feeling kind of of, it is for me, of, oh, I guess I'm doing this right. Because <laughs> I definitely, I definitely see where I'm still stuck. Um, you know, this, this idea that we need to abandon ordinary activities um, and that we need to really over and over reduce our negative emotions. It's tough work. All of us, I, I think, I haven't looked completely on each page, but none of us at, at current moment are monastics living that life. And even if we were, of course, many day-to-day -day challenges, emotional struggles, difficulties. But the way that we're living the conventional world and yet trying to be against the stream is hard, but worth it. Is that a question, Pamela and or Mace? Okay. I'm ready for it. Should you have one? Um, but yeah, I'd be, I'd be curious. What, what does that kind of stir up for you all hearing that this best instruction is one that hits your secret faults? Best teacher. Yes, I see Tracy. Please unmute, Tracy. Oh, great. Can you hear me? I sure can. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm really moved and confused at the same time by um, the, the, the piece about, um, You said something, and, and and I know it's in the text, and I know I've read it, but like I'm, it's I'm, it's losing my, it's losing clarity right now. But um, about being the willingness to challenge, the willingness to see, the willingness to challenge the kind of like the shadow, or the willingness to mm. challenge the unseen difficulties in other people as he, as a healer, as a guide, as a therapist, as a, you know, in, in my case, I guess I can only speak as a therapist, as a guide, as a healer, um, that, that fine line of like being with and pressing forward is like, it feels so, um, so tricky right now, more so than ever, like so, mm -hmm difficult right now because of the um I don't know the the thin layer of how much uh I don't know I guess is at risk yeah yeah and I think yeah thank you I love what you said that like uh I think you said there's both like um a richness and a discomfort or an uncertainty and a, and a new interest and um yeah that's a a great sign that you're taking it in and like you know turning it over in your mind which is what we have to do with these texts and you know I, I I'm not sure if I captured exactly your point but I think possibly this idea of how much do we push people um or yeah. encourage them yeah I mean yes I think in the context of the Buddha Dharma and these teachings I can share these I can share this because a lot of these are unrealistic expectations for us and they're provocative in a good way when it comes to being especially a therapist or a guide um yeah it, it is really hard to know where that line is of um of gentleness um, and then of you know over accommodating or um how are we how are we able to create our own boundaries and then hopefully model that for others. Um, mm -hmm. It's a real, um, you know, from, again, from the context of, of Dharma, you know, oh, it's great actually. The very next thing, um, one of the next things that we, are, we'll, we will look at is like, what is the best way to be generous to others? And it is thought that there are different kinds of generosity one of the most generous things we can do in this lifetime is to share the Dharma. But if we are not necessarily like feeling that that's our life stage at this moment, the best way to share it is to resolve our own emotional defilements. Mm. Like the best way to share the Dharma is to be the Dharma. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know if that speaks to it, but right, I think um, this idea of like, how do we really help others? And, and as a therapist, Happily, your job is to help others, but for a lot of us, right, how do we help others who are friends or family members who are suffering and struggling, especially with the same material over and over, it can feel exhausting to kind of go on the same ride. Mm -hmm. And you want to maybe, you know, um, be a mirror or reflect. Um, and we just don't know, of course, how that will be received. So often, we have to fall back on what actually is really hard, which is, you know, endeavor. He says, endeavor earnestly with mindfulness and vigilance in the task of clearing away defiled emotions according to the instructions of the spiritual teaching. And that sometimes that's the very best thing we do for others. It's a little bit of a cop out. I get it, but um, I think it's, I just appreciate you raising that point and, and something again, for those of us, in a role of like helping professions it's one thing and for those of us with friends and family wow always a challenge yeah nice edge is that what you said yeah yeah fine edge fine edge like it's just like yeah. a fine it's a really um really tenacious like i don't know tightrope right now with friends family and clients like all of whom are in my 
realm of love, like deep love. I mean, yeah. sometimes I don't feel like there's actually very much difference between the realms of like my relationships with clients, with family, with friends, like um, the boundaries are different, but the, the, the connection and the intensity of like what the healing is at where and what, how the healing is happening is um, it's not that different. And yet it's, it's just really, mm, it's hard to, it's hard to know when to push and when to hold right now. I, I mm -hmm. feel like harder than ever when to push and when to hold. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, going back to our, our eight month uh, journey through the Lo Jong slogans, really giving up hope of fruition, mm -hmm. you know, that, yeah. you know, not giving up hope, right? We care, we love, the compassion is boundless and amazing. If we can break down the barriers of, of who we include in our sphere of care, but always coming back to doing it without this hope of fruition. And I'm glad you reminded me, you know, the, the opening of this chapter, Mathieu Ricard, who's you know, the editor and, and author of this book um, or author of this collection, he says that the virtues can only be transcendent like they can become kind of not just something rote if their practice of the understanding that the three aspects of whatever one does, the subject, the object, and the action itself are empty of intrinsic reality. Mm. In other words, they're only transcendent when they're impregnated with wisdom. So he gives the example that transcendent generosity is not just giving, but it's being free from the notion of I and mine. I think that idea of like, how do we you know, enact this care for another and have it feel as free as it can from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Okay. Hey. So beautiful. So let's do, yes, let's go on to this generosity piece here. Um, <clears throat> there's a beautiful, on page 111, beautiful description by Fengzer Rinpoche on these three different kinds of generosity. And there's a generosity of material things, the generosity of protection from fear, and the generosity of the gift of Dharma. Um, one of the things I really, I really like, this is an old saying, I think you can see my hands. I have my AirPods here in one hand, that we can practice being generous by just placing something in one hand to another as though we were giving it away. <laughs> so like, I'm not ready to give my AirPods away, but what if I were, what would that feel like? I just, I love that as like a simple instruction for like, how could we play with giving something away that we cherish? that we love and um, you know, saying that we can get better and better. You know, essentially, uh, especially with material things, the instruction throughout this chapter is, don't forget you're gonna die. That also helps, right? You're gonna die, these will no longer be your things, feel the generosity. And of course, the last decade of research shows very clearly that that act of giving such a source of joy, such an incredible opportunity of well-being for ourselves. Um, so not only is it going to be parted with us when we die anyway, let's enjoy it right now by, by giving it away. And this doesn't say give away everything, live as a wandering aesthetic. It's just as much as possible, cultivate this, not just like act of generosity, but this generosity as way of being. I, I might have told the story, so I'm sorry, but the first time I got to meet His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I was 15, I think. I attended this free Tibet conference and um, there he was, you know, meeting groups of students who did free Tibet work and shaking hands, getting a photo, next, right? Every student group, of course, came with our like gift, we got him. I have no idea if we got him, probably. Something totally cheesy <clears throat> and, um, I would watch him, I watched him on the groups before and he would <laughs> receive this gift and be so delighted, like so delighted. And the next group would come 
and he'd offer them the gift and he just would give it away, you know? And that I just, I think about that. Like, it wasn't like, he's like, don't give me a gift. I am beyond gifts. He fully enjoyed receiving it and then just fully gave it away. So that's the kind of quality we, we'd like to start, start developing. And this idea of this gift of protection from fear, really beautiful. It says, this means to protect the lives of those who are imprisoned or being punished or tortured. Protect wild animals that are being chased by hunters or cattle or sheep destined for the slaughterhouse. To help people who are endangered by disease and evil forces. It also means to train one's mind in the aspiration, actually, to liberate all beings from the endless sufferings of samsara, the source of constant fear and to bring them to the perfect ease of nirvana. Beginners should practice generosity according to their capacity. So the danger is, if they don't have the ability to give what is difficult to give and overreach themselves imprudently, they will fall into discouragement and regret. There's a risk that the attitude of bodhicitta will be lost. It's really sober, that assessment. Like, of course, we want to be generous and we want to really extend our generosity to those who are suffering, especially from fear, the primary way we suffer. And he's, you know, expressing here that, in fact, all beings are suffering from fear because they're caught trying to chase what is fundamentally insubstantial and insecure about losing what is also fundamentally insubstantial. But if we go too far, if we set our sights too far, it will become overwhelmed. It's almost like kind of dampening our bodhicitta. Unfortunately, there's not another sentence of how to go midway with your bodhicitta. That's up to us. But this idea of, you know, we can have, you know, that ultimate level, right, of just desiring all beings to be free. And then that relative level, how do we take care of the beings who we can take care of? and not get too caught up in those we can't, simple. And this last aspect of, of generosity, so material things, protection from fear, and then the gift of the Dharma. Uh, the true gift of the Dharma is, is to impart instruction to others <clears throat> according to their capacity. However, it is difficult for people who are on the level of aspirational practice to give the teachings in this way, since they might not be able to expound on the Dharma clearly, either in word or meaning. And this is what I was just sharing with Tracy there, that at this stage, one should consider altruistic attitude as the main practice and endeavor earnestly with, clearing, with the task of clearing away defiled emotions according to the instructions of one spiritual teacher. For someone whose mind is free, untouched by the worldly concerns, uncluttered by distraction and busyness, the main thing is to bring the benefit to others. Once to then teach the Dharma to others according to their type, capacity, aspiration, and character through the principles of karma to create perfection. So being able to share the Dharma includes being able to just clear up our own mind. That feels doable. That feels reasonable. Um, yeah. What are defiled emotions? Beautiful question. So defiled emotions, according, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I'll give you a brief answer. Uh, these are the ones that get in the way of actually kind of what might be called our more um, altruistic mind states. So there's uh, an assumption that our altruistic mind states, those of compassion, loving kindness, empathetic joy, that's our natural state of being. And we want to cultivate that and sustain that. And one way we need to do that is to kind of help get underneath our defiled emotions, including jealousy and anger, aversion, pride. And our defiled emotions may or may not in and of themselves be bad or wrong, but generally they are enacted in a way that kind of prevents us from connecting to other people. Usually it creates either a sense of clinging or aversion, right? We just, we're just totally run rampant. And you'll hear over and over across all Buddhist texts that it's one of our greatest foes, our greatest enemies. Um, I have a little sensitivity to that since I don't think emotions are per se our enemies. 
I do think we can enact them in really destructive ways, very harmful. But that our anger in and of itself is not a problem, right? Like as Lisa was sharing with us, feeling angry when we're hurt, that's not a problem. Um, however, how do we act? How do we respond? Can we find wholesome, constructive ways to respond? Um, I think we have enough time. We, we won't get into patience this week, but luckily you have patience for next week. Um, but I will talk about discipline because there's only one entry. So discipline, the second of these six, six paramitas. I, I really love this one. It would be the least likely one I think I would like just by the name, discipline. That does not sound um, very appealing. It doesn't sound like something that's going to help make my practice kind of have its richness and juiciness. But in fact, the essence of discipline is the firm decision to refrain from harming others and even from having the idea of doing so. It is a repudiation of all that is contrary to the precepts. The teachings on disciplines are expounded under three headings the avoidance of negative actions and thoughts, word and deed, the undertaking of positive action and benefiting others. That's our discipline. We have to adhere you know, to body, speech and mind through our actions in non-harming. He, he, he here says just for others, I, I of course include us in that. It's a huge discipline. If any of you have tried this discipline of non-harming towards yourself really ardently, it's hard to make it through because we're talking about thoughts here too. So it has to not just be, you know, maybe we made ourselves a nice cup of coffee and, you know, slept well and generally are taking care of ourselves. But then there's also that internal aspect. And then just, again, those really simple, quick things we do. I, I definitely noticed in my life I often move fast, right? A lot of things to do and I move fast. That can be really kind of unkind to myself at a fundamental level, harmful. Move fast and kind of things don't get done that well and then let's deal with them later. Maybe, you know, you forget to put the right, uh, you forget to go grocery shopping, you don't have oat milk for your coffee. All that, it's like very simple, but we can get to this granular level of how do we want to be like truly kind? truly non-harming. And then this idea that in addition to avoiding those negative actions, thoughts, word, and deed, that we're really engaging in positive actions, we're doing good. The discipline of always really being aware of what is the good we can do? Is there more good we can do? And benefiting others. It's just it's the right kind of discipline we should adhere ourselves to. It's so sweet. Um, and it's interesting, um, for those of you who have the book, it's, there's like a couple pages on every other one and discipline just has it's like this, this one entry. That's it. Got it. You're done. It's very clear. Be nice. Be kind to yourself and others. Um, okay. I see a question here from Heidi. I don't feel qualified to teach others the dharma even i think it's presumptuous but i try to demonstrate it with my actions and some people pick up on that exactly it's exactly right heidi i think you know we can only like gift our family member copies of dharma books so many times <laughs> before they start to get annoyed and we just you know are sending podcasts i don't know that's the thing i do now like oh you might really like this um i do think and I, and I think working on our own minds and our own hearts, because it's, especially with <clears throat> our desire to help those closest to us, that compassion, that desire to help, it's, um, it can be exhausting if we're kind of always, like, when is it going to happen? When am I going to be able to help them? When, when can I do this? When if we can really rest and, and feel a sense of just, just cultivating our own inner resources, working on, you know, kind of clearing the channels of those defiled emotions, cultivating that sense of real care, that when we have that opportunity, that when that person we've wanted to help says, I really need your help, we're ready. We're not tired. We're not feeling like, why didn't you ask me five years ago? What took you so long, right? Like we are refreshed and ready. 
Shauna says, I sometimes share a nugget of Dharma without considering myself a Dharma teacher. I hope to cultivate my intention not to do harm and provide safety. Thank you, Dharma. Nice to see you. Yes, I'm sure those nuggets go very far in your community, in your friends. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it is kind of amazing. I, I don't know if you guys experience this. You share like some simple thing from the practices and can really touch people. I really can. Really lovely. Really lovely to think about. So let's give ourselves just a couple moments here to get back into practice, dedicate our merit. So reconnecting to the body, to the breath. Noticing if there's any sense of spark, of connection, of care from our time together from sharing these teachings. And we can imagine that spark, that inspiration of these teachings and its potential to radiate out, reaching others, reaching others, reaching others. And when we come together and share this time with the teachings, we have this opportunity to dedicate our work, to expand the benefit of this time together by sending out a heartfelt intention that all beings would know a sense of belonging and connection, that all beings could be free from fear and the causes of fear. that all beings could feel safe and held in love. That all beings could know true freedom. Thanks everyone, nice to see you. Happy New Year. Next week, patience, stay tuned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.